First Timothy, as I said, and the sermon is about what to expect from your pastors and elders. Or, if I can give a bit of a broader term to it, what to expect from your spiritual leaders. Not only your pastors and elders, but anyone who has an influence on you spiritually. Be it children, your parents, or be it anyone, parents and adults whom you listen to online. What to expect from your spiritual leaders. And Pastor Timothy and it will be no surprise to us, will be our case study of what every church attendee, what every church member, what every Christian should expect from those who lead them spiritually. Paul wrote to Timothy this letter, and his purpose is given, at least one of his purposes are given in chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. 1 Timothy 3, verse 14 and 15, I hope to come to you soon. Paul tells Timothy they've had a very close ministry relationship. He says, I hope to come to you soon. But I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. That's serious. This is on how to behave in church, and it's not written to the three-year-old toddler in the back corner. It is not written to the teenage son sitting somewhere in the middle of the congregation making a scene of himself. This is written to the pastor of the church so that he will know how he ought to behave in the church. And then it was written down for us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that every Christian will know how the pastor ought to behave in the church. And why is this important? Because the church is the household of God. We all submit to God as the Father. The pastor is not the Father in the church. God is. We have to understand it's the household of God. We have to understand it is the church of the living God. We're not just inherent, not just those who inherited the church. He is currently actively still alive and in charge of his church. And very significantly also, the church is a pillar and buttress of the truth. It upholds the truth so all can see, and if it crumble, the church crumbles, the truth won't have its effects. It's a buttress for the truth. It keeps the truth up. And if this buttress crumbles, no one will experience the strength of spiritual truth. Listen to me, Timothy, Paul says. There is a right way and a wrong way for spiritual leaders to behave. And you need to know what the right way is. Then in chapter 4, Paul addresses some of the issues in the church that Timothy was serving. It's the church of Ephesus, as far as we know from, from the rest of the accounts in Scripture and outside Scripture. He's at the church of Ephesus at this time. And this chapter 4 begins with some of the issues in a church in Ephesus. And then he says this in verse 6. Chapter 4, verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, then you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. If you as the pastor preach this to the brothers and sisters in the pew, then you will be behaving properly in the church. At the end of verse 7, Paul adds a little bit of personal advice to Timothy on a more practical way too. He says, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. There's a wrong way to behave as a spiritual leader, and that is getting involved with frivolous discussions and endless myths and stories and legends and and conspiracy theories, but there's a right way to act. And it not only includes truth, it also includes godliness. Godliness. You see the summary of this in verse 16 of chapter 4. Keep a close watch on yourself how you are behaving, and on the teaching. There's godliness, and you have to keep a close watch on that, and there's teaching. Two sides to the behavior of spiritual leaders that are requiring attention, of spiritual leaders and those in their churches. 
Now, what's significant of, of verse 16 is not only the fact that it combines these two major themes in the book, personal godliness and teach the truth, but look at why it requires it of the spiritual leader. Verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself, keep a close watch on your teaching, persist in this, don't get distracted, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, this is obviously not save in a sense of saving you from your sins. This is save is a very broad word. This is saving you and your you and your hearers from falsehood. It's saving you and your hearers from ungodliness. But the point is not so much the saving them from this. The point is it's for you, and the benefit is for those who listen to you. And that's why this is a good text to a book to preach to the church and not just to the shepherds. The point is this, there are expectations from God for every spiritual leader in His church. Those expectations must be known not only to the spiritual leaders, but also to their followers. Also to their followers. Spiritual leaders will give account of their faithfulness of God, to God's expectations in their work. They'll give account to God for that. But the saints must know these expectations because if they do not, they might never end up hearing the true gospel. And they might never understand what it means to live in this life as a truly godly man or woman. The leaders will give an account, and they're responsible to fulfill those expectations. But if you don't know what those expectations are, you'll never expect them, and it can be to your spiritual detriments. And so in chapter 4, verse 11 to 16, that will be our passage today. We'll go back up to verse 11. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 11 to 16, we find these two intertwined expectations that every Christian should have of all their spiritual leaders. We'll extend it beyond the local church because we live in the internet age. But you need these two expectations from all your spiritual leaders, especially those whom God has placed over you, and that would then be the local church spiritual leaders. Let's read the verses together. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11 to 16. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching, Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy, when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. These are the Ten Commandments for pastors, by the way. I don't know if Paul did this intentionally. There's ten imperatives, ten commandments in these verses. And you can summarize them in two, two categories. The godly categories and the teaching truth category. It's a bit like the Ten Commandments of Moses to the nation of Israel under the rule of God as their king. Ten Commandments summarized as love God and love your neighbor. I don't know if it's an intentional parallel, but it's a striking one. Ten Commandments, verse 1. Command is the first commandment. You need to command people. Second commandment, teach, verse 11. Command and teach. Verse 12, third commandment, let no one despise. And fourth, set an example. Verse 13, devote yourself to reading and preaching and teaching. Devotion is the fifth one. Verse 14, number 6, do not neglect your teaching gifts. Verse 15, number, what's that, 7 and 8. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them. Verse 16, keep a watch. Persist. Number 9 and 10. 
ten pastoral commands. But they overlap with, with such intentional comprehensiveness that you soon realize that the Ten Commandments for spiritual leaders are actually just an intertwining of two commands. Two commandments, two categories of commandments, two expectations from God on your spiritual leaders. Two expectations, then, that you must have for those who influence you spiritually. The first command is regarding truth, and some of those commandments fall in that category. And all the other commandments fall in a separate category, and it's the category of godliness. Godliness. Now, we are going to separate them for the sake of discussion, but they're not separated in the text, and I want to point that out to you because I'm going to separate them. But you should know they shouldn't be separated. Don't separate these. No, I've got these spiritual leaders in my life that teach me truth. They're called MP3 pastors. Livestream pastors, I guess. MP3 is outdated. And then I've got pastors in my church and spiritual leaders in my church that, that model godliness for me and counsel me and tell me to stop the sin and put on righteousness. We, you can't do that. These expectations are intertwined. I'm going to separate them for the sake of explanation, but the text doesn't separate them. In fact, we're going to jump around the text back and forth all the time to be able to separate them. Do not separate these expectations. They're completely intertwined. Be careful of learning truth from someone who doesn't practice godliness, and be careful to learn godliness from somebody who doesn't believe the truth. We'll separate them for the sake of clarity, but rest assured that you should not separate them in your expectations. And so our first expectation for every spiritual leader that every Christian should have of those spiritual leaders is expect your spiritual leader to teach and believe truth. They need to teach it, and they actually have to believe it themselves too. But half the commentaries on my shelf are men who teach the truth fairly well even, but they themselves don't actually believe it. Well, they can teach us something about Greek and Hebrew perhaps, but they cannot teach us truth if they don't believe it themselves. We know from the qualifications for elders in and, and 1 Timothy um, chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1 that um, an elder, a leader in the church must be able to teach truth. In fact, Titus says he has to hold fast to the Word himself so that he's able to both teach the truth and expose the nonsense. Now, the obvious reason why you should expect your spiritual leader to teach and believe the truth is because every single person in this world is born spiritually blind to the truth. <coughs> blind to the truth. Even this week, I shared the gospel with somebody from the Scriptures, and there was just nothing. No response. No response of conversion. Why? Because we're spiritually blinded to the truth. And that is why we need teachers of the truth. We have a natural aversion to truth. Even us who are saved sometimes say that, right? I, I don't feel like I can read my Bible today. I just feel so guilty about sin. Because that aversion to the truth that, that sin in us creates... And then on top of our natural aversion to truth that is sadly our downfall every time, there's an abundance of false teaching out there. So that even the moment you do desire truth, you can't always find it. Because of the nonsense being preached by so-called Christians. Wrong beliefs abound. Wrong emphases in the Scripture on the true beliefs abound. And so your spiritual leaders should be those men who can distinguish between truth and falsehood. They should be able to tr distinguish between truth and almost truth. And they should be able to teach the truth and stay away from the nonsense. We saw that right very quickly there in verse 7. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. I think the, the, the modern version of that is YouTube. <laughs> have nothing to do with just the nonsense available to mankind under the banner of Christianity. 
Christian TV falls in that category have nothing to do with it, spiritual leaders. Don't be the ones who use it to kind of get to the gospel in some way. Have nothing to do with it. Stay away from senseless myths, useless explanations, ridiculous imaginary kind of teachings, supposedly from Scripture. Spiritual leaders might love to, to stay in touch with what's going on in the world and be on top of things, and that, that might be fine, but they should not get entangled with it. They shouldn't use it as a platform from which to hope and present truth. We need to hold fast to the Word. I saw a, a title. I'm, I'm terrible at reading blog posts, theological blog posts, because sometimes the title just says it all, so I have no no further desire to read the post. But this was a good title. It said, uh, Pastor, for the sake of your church, don't stay, on, eh, don't stay informed of the news. <laughs> Typically, the council's the other way around. Stay informed of the news so that you know how, in what world the people are living. It's like the Bible tells you what world the people are living in. <laughs> if you want to be a faithful spiritual leader, you need to hold fast to the truth. And you might be interested in politics and the news and things like that, but you better hold fast to the truth, not to the news. You know the nonsense that's out there. It so easily just kind of draws us in because it's intriguing, and it's, it's more intriguing than the Bible itself even. And it tells us things that the Bible doesn't tell us, and that makes us very interested in it. It's a problem. You've heard the same nonsense like I do. Okay, these memes with half-baked biblical truths, these opinions and feelings that people share that oppose the truth. Oh, but I just feel that, that it's, it should be better this way. I had somebody tell me two weeks ago, uh, what, what you preach is all well and fine, but you know, practically we do things a bit differently. Uh, we, we can't get sucked into that in Christianity. Or these paranoid conspiracies about the end. They all have enough truth in them to appear important, but it's just an appearance because they miss the point of truth altogether. God already chose what we need to know on the topic, and He chose the medium by which we're going to know it. We're going to read His Word, not we're going to think about it. It was a big deal for Timothy in a place like Ephesus, Ephesus was, was a strong mixture of, of Jewish traditions and Roman traditions, all parading themselves as truth. And they were two opposite systems, the Jewish and the Roman, and so you had these two opposite systems, and then you had this kind of this merge in between where people tried to take the bows from both worlds, and it was a complete mess. It was important to come on and teach the truth. Look at the closing warning that, uh, that ends this book. Chapter 6, verse 20. You know this is heavy on the Apostle Paul's heart because he closes the book with, with a very strong exhortation. Normally his books end with a, a lovely benediction, and this one does too. It's just very brief. Grace be with you. That's all he says. Okay, there's, there's no like two verses of wonderful God-exalting benediction. He's got a heavy heart for Timothy in a place like Ephesus. Oh, Timothy, verse 20 of chapter 6. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Well, some of you were in churches like that, where the pastor professed all those other things that have the appearance of knowledge, and they have swerved the entire church from the faith. There are enough people in the world spending their time in nothing better than talking about everything that they supposedly can know, but which is actually not 100% sure. Your spiritual leaders should not be one of them. Your spiritual leaders should not be one of them. Your spiritual leader, if he will stay the truth and lead you in the truth, must himself teach and know the truth 
and nothing else. Don't expect your pastor to be the know-all of every newest fad going around on email or Twitter or whatever. Expect him to know his Bible and to teach it well. And that when you come to him and say, I heard this nonsense, I'm sure, I hope you didn't hear about it because it's a waste of time, but I heard it, what do I do with it? He can still answer you because he knows his Bible. Let's look at our words of our text today. See it in our text here. This, one, this first expectation to teach and believe truth. Verse 11, command and teach these things. These things. These things is a little bit hard to, to pinpoint in Timothy because you kind of look to verses 8 to find it and you see it also talks about these things. So you go ahead and ahead and eventually you've covered the whole book trying to figure out what is these things. He constantly in his book goes between doctrinal truth and practical godliness. And so these things is this intertwining of truth and its effects on you. Come on and teach these things. Come on and teach the truth. Come on and teach the fact that you have to live godly in light of the truth. It's still our first expectation because he's teaching this. But part of teaching truth is teaching godliness. Oh, he has to teach and model it too. We'll get to that in a moment. But teaching godliness is part and parcel of teaching truth. Teach sound doctrine. Command the godliness. And maybe that's why those two imperatives are there. The one is command that, that, that propels and compels behavior. Teaching is informing the mind. Already you kind of see that two-edged element to it. That is a pastor's responsibility before God. Before God, a spiritual leader must command and teach truth. Expect your spiritual leaders to tell you what to believe and to explain it from Scripture. Expect from your, believer, from your spiritual leaders not to tell you stories that are cute and memorable, but to teach you truth. And if they will tell a story, it's only to serve the purpose of the explanation of truth. Lest you follow the wrong kind of spiritual leader and believe the wrong teaching and obey the wrong commands, jump down to verses 13 and 14. Let's we'll skip over verse 12 for now because that's the, the practice godliness part. Verse 13 and 14, until I come, remember Paul's hoping to come, but he might delay. So he says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. The gift here refers most likely to Timothy's gift of teaching, his gift of preaching. In this case, um, in, the, in light of being uh, sent out by the apostles, it was done by prophecy even. He, he got a prophetic word from the Lord through the apostles of Jesus Christ. Remember, that's still happening. Paul is still there. And they laid their hands on him and said, God has gifted you with a gift of preaching. Okay, we, we don't have that kind of prophetic element of exposing our gifts to us. We just practice them and see what the Spirit blesses. That's how we figure out we might have a gift of teaching. He had it by prophecy. <laughs> it was stunningly clear. And Paul says, don't neglect the gift of teaching. Preaching the gospel in a city he was a missionary for the most part, a pastor now, but a missionary for the most part. Stay there. Share the gospel with everyone. If some get saved, plant a church, establish the church, and when it's established, move on to the next place and preach the gospel again. Just preach the truth. We saw that in the book of Acts. No matter where Paul goes, he might appeal to some cultural things to help them understand things, but he's always preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The most important spiritual gift for a man like him, a missionary man, is the gift of preaching. And that's what it refers to here. How is the gift of preaching rightly used? Because you might say, well, preaching has kind of a, a wide spectrum of, of application, doesn't it? Um, I, I don't want to tell you to, to watch Christian TV because it's terrible. But if you watch Christian TV, you will see how wide a spectrum there is for the word preaching. 
Almost anything nowadays is considered preaching. What is preaching? Verse 13. If he has to not neglect this gift of teaching and preaching, what is it? Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. What is a spiritual leader's primary task? Read the Bible out loud. Read it out loud. Public reading of Scripture. Gavin gave us a bonus extra reading of Scripture today. Okay, that, that's what elders do. They read the Scriptures, and then once the Scriptures are read, they exhort and teach. They don't teach something they thought of this week, and it really hit, hit home to them, and then they read the Bible to find a verse that says that. That's the wrong way around. They read the Scriptures, and then the Scriptures that they've read, they use for exhortation. Exhortation is kind of that very nice way of, of making you feel really convicted and change. It's, it's, but it's a nice way, because the, the, with a smile on the face. Okay? It's exhortation. It's stronger than just, I'm encouraging you to believe this. No, you have to believe it. But it's not quite a rebuke yet either. It's just that wonderful in-between exhorts. And then teach. There are things in Scripture as you read them that are hard to understand. So explain it to them. That's the expectation of spiritual leaders. A spiritual leader that reads something else for inspiration in a sermon or explains something else or teaches something else or doesn't teach what he read but teaches something he hasn't read, something he thought about, is not a qualified spiritual leader. Read the Scriptures. That's the authority. And then as you're reading it, compel obedience and belief in your exhortation. Clarify what is hard to understand. Inform what people are ignorant of. Verse 16 again. Jump down to verse 16. Keep a close watch on yourself and keep a close watch on the teaching. On the teaching. That's a pastor's job description. <laughs> I asked somebody who runs conferences what he does when a conference speaker starts speaking nonsense. Now, hopefully that never happens because you don't invite him if you know he's going to speak nonsense. But he shared a story of where he had to stop a guy once because we're keeping a watch on the teaching. We're not just letting it happen. We're watching it. Part of our elders who don't preach regularly's job is to watch my teaching. <laughs> we talk about it in our elders' meeting. Let's review the last four Sundays. And then sometimes there's a comment, hey, we have to talk about this in a service or that in a service. Maybe you have to preach about this. Maybe we shouldn't preach about that just yet. Come on and teach sound doctrine. Read the Bible, exhort from the Scriptures, teach the Scriptures. Use well the gift of preaching that you have from God and keep doing this for your own spiritual benefit and for the spiritual benefit of those who listen to you. That is God's expectation of a spiritual leader. At least you think that this is just one of the many things expected of a spiritual leader. Have a look at how many more times this issue of teaching truth comes up in the letters written to the preachers of the New Testament. Some years after 1 Timothy was written, Paul wrote that in another letter, and, and we call it 2 Timothy because of that. And it says the same thing. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is no small task for a spiritual leader. This isn't the task for the end of the week, and in the middle of the week, he actually takes care of other things, and he, he sets the vision, and he, and he plans strategies. No, this is it. 2 Timothy 3 verse 10. He talks about the, the nonsense uh, going around um, in Ephesus in chapter 3 verse 1 to 9. and verse 10, he says, You, however... That, however, is already a lesson by itself. Okay, there's all kinds of nonsense out there. You, however, not and you, it's but you. 
You're somewhere else. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and my sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. So that's the, the first and second missionary journey there. Which persecutions I endured, yet from all them the Lord rescued me. Jump down to verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned. You have followed the apostolic teaching, now continue in it. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, the apostle of Jesus Christ. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for your pastoral duties, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Teaching. And then those other three are kind of subdivisions of exhortation. Exhort them. So that, verse 17, the man of God, referring more pronouncedly to him rather than everyone in the church, so that the spiritual leader himself may be competent, equipped for every good work. What he's saying is, Timothy, you have a great example of truth. You've seen it in me, Paul says. And you have the Holy Scriptures. And so remember where you learned it from. You learned the truth from the Apostle of Christ. You know it's true. And therefore now continue in it. And what do you continue in it? In the Scriptures. The Scriptures are profitable for your teaching and preaching ministry. Not the news. Not the funniest meme. Not a cool anecdote. There are literally books written on a uh, thousand illustrations for preaching. Okay, it's helpful sometimes if you have a very non-creative mind and you need to explain something complex. But that's not our inspiration for preaching. The Scriptures are profitable for teaching and all the nuances of exhortation. Look at chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, famous verses for spiritual leaders. I charge you... And it's, it's not charged as an exacting money from you or something like that or, or attaching you to electric circuit. It's charged in the sense of, of a court. I charge you, you are going to be guilty in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who is the judge. Okay, so there's your courtroom setting. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Three synonyms there with more or less positive or negative emphasis. With complete patience and teaching. I charge you, you are going to be guilty on the day that Christ returns of preaching the Word. Timothy at the Scriptures. And yet Paul, as it were, breathing down his neck every Monday when he sits down to prepare for Sunday's sermon, saying for the sake of Jesus' second coming and for the sake of Judgment Day, preach the Scriptures. Be ready at all times to open the Scriptures and from those Scriptures to reprove and rebuke and exhort and teach. And if you have to be very patient, be patient, but keep teaching. Be always ready, but patient, irrespective of whatever situation you're in, teach the Word. Jesus is coming and Judgment Day is approaching, so spiritual leaders need to teach the Word for their sake and yours. Again, I was speaking to a pastor, an older, more experienced pastor once, and, and talking about the, the compromises that, that some make in their church. And, and, and there's some wisdom in it, you think, sometimes. And, and his response was just a blatant rejection of my, it makes sense sometimes. He says, no, that guy's going to stand before God in judgment one day for that decision. <laughs> and still the fear of God in you again, doesn't it? 2 Timothy 3, verse 15 says, Scripture is able to make you wise to salvation. So what else can we bring to our unbeliever? The Scriptures. 
The Scriptures have the ability to make them wise to salvation. Be it our little three-year-old sitting in our, in our lap while reading the Bible at breakfast time, or be it our child who's left the home already and is caught in sin, the Scriptures are the power of God to salvation. They can make you wise to salvation. So if you want any hope of salvation, then, then don't expect your spiritual leader to teach from anything else but Scripture. Do expect them to teach from nothing else but Scripture. And this isn't just a, an intellectual exercise of, of just teach the truth and make sure they know the knowledge. Because chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is profitable for teaching and then for the exhortation things, for reproof, telling you you're wrong, for correction, telling you how to do it right, for training, to helping you do it right. It's profitable, not just intellectual. So when I say expect your spiritual leader to teach and believe the truth, I mean truth and the right intellectual knowledge and the application of that truth in all of your life. He has to teach the knowledge of truth and he has to command the application of that truth. Pastors, elders, preachers on YouTube, whatever it might be, are men with a mandate from God to teach the truth in its entirety, with all the implications that come with it for your behavior. Back to 1 Timothy 4 then. intertwined with this expectation of teaching and, and believing the truth, there's another expectation for spiritual leaders. And together these two make the, the, the rope that holds pastoral ministry together. The ad other category of intertwined expectations that you should have of every spiritual leader that influences you is you have to expect them to model and require godliness. They have to require it. We talked about that a little bit already. They have to command it. And they also have to model it, though. They themselves have to submit to the commandments of the Scripture that they are teaching. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, in the, the elder qualifications, very clearly there, it says, an elder must be above reproach. It's like this overarching qualification. Just get that right, and then he explains a little bit what to look for. In verse 7 of chapter 3, he says, Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. He should be such a model of godliness that even unbelievers like him. And they cannot say anything bad about him. That's a high standard, isn't it? And if the church isn't going to expect it of the spiritual leaders, God still is. And so maybe we should start expecting it from our spiritual leaders so that they can indeed meet the standards. Too many a church leader has fallen because the church has given up on that expectation. Saying, well, he's, he's, a, he's a really good teacher. He doesn't actually have to be godly. He's a really good teacher. Well, you know, he, he used to be a missionary. How can we deny him spiritual leadership in our church? Oh, he's done so much good in ministry. The Lord has used him in so many ways. So the fact that he has left his wife and abandoned his kids and is now um, guilty of fraud with SARS, it doesn't really matter. He's just such a wonderful man, and, and he's so gifted by the Lord. People say things like that. 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, we saw it already. I have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. It doesn't just say train yourself to be a better preacher, as useful as that might be. It says, no, stay away from the nonsense, teach the truth, but also work hard at training yourself for godliness. Unfortunately, godliness doesn't have an academic standard by which you can measure it at seminary. And so seminary focuses on teaching you the truth, and it can't really give you a grade for your godliness because it's not academic standards. It doesn't mean it's not a God expectation. 
Look at our verses. We looked at verse 11. Come on and teach these things. Verse 12 of 1 Timothy 4. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and in your conduct and in your love and in your faith and in your purity. Look at verse 15, another verse we skipped over earlier. Practice these things yourself. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. That's an interesting verse, that. It was very convicting the first time I understood it. Timothy was fairly young, relatively young, compared to Paul and Titus, for example. And so he says, don't let them despise your youth. You just be more godly than them, okay? Set them an example. And, And they'll get over the fact that you're young. You know it, right? You've met many a godlier young man than some old men. Godlier younger women than some older women. And so he was in that position and he had to be the godlier younger man. But then verse 15 says, they need to see your progress. That's a humbling instruction. A, a, more, a more expected instruction, in my mind at least, was so that they can see your godliness. <laughs> okay, set the example and let them see it in your behavior. But that's not what the verse says, is it? It says, set the standard up there. Come on and teach what God said. And then set an example. But your example is going to be somewhere below that line. But let them see how you grow in godliness. Not let them see your godliness and how wonderful you are and you're better than them and holier than them. No, let them see that though you might be godlier than them and you should be, that you are growing yourself still. Let them see how a Christian becomes more holy, not just is holy. That's humbling. Because now you realize the pastor himself isn't on that standard that he's commanding. Oh, but I can't tell people to stop a certain sin if I struggle with it. Of course you can. As long as you're preaching to yourself too. Joel James preached on humility at the Shepherds Conference. And you'll never hear a sermon on humility if the pastor has to be perfect in it before he can preach on it. God set the standard. You have to come on and teach those things, spiritual leader, and then you yourself have to attain to it in such a way that they can see not only you're living more godly, but you're living more godly. (laughs) More godly than you were last year this time. Therefore, it's not only the standard of godliness that a pastor ought to model, it is also the method towards that standard, the progress towards it, the path to it in our entire life that they must be able to witness. God required of Timothy to preach the word for these pastoral purposes of commanding certain behavior, and then he said, Timothy, I want you to be doing it yourself. None of this, you do as you're told and don't do as you see in me. None of that. We need godly spiritual leaders. One of the biggest problems of our internet age is that we have great teachers who teach us great things, but you have no idea how godly they actually are. You just assume they're godly. How many of you have seen John MacArthur in action outside the pulpit? John Piper. Pick your favorite preacher. (laughs) But if young Timothy, as a spiritual leader, can grow in godliness, then certainly the rest of us can too, right? Oh, but you can't teach your old dog new tricks is an argument I've heard many times in counseling, especially as a younger preacher, younger counselor. I I literally had somebody tell me, I've got more years of marriage experience than you have of life. To which I thankfully already had the courage to say, yes, but I think I know my Bible better. (laughs) But if a young Timothy can grow in godliness, everyone else can. Yes, but I'm an old dog. You can't teach me new tricks. I've got much more experience than you. I know how life really works. Well, you're not a dog. (laughs) So you too can make progress. You can learn a new trick. The Holy Spirit will help you learn a new trick. Show yourself, Timothy, to be an example that they can follow of continually increasing godliness. There are a couple categories there at the end of verse 12, right? Set the believers an example, and then he picks a few categories there. Speech, well, that's obvious in the the words you say and the way you say them. Okay, we, we need examples in that, right? 
Um, all the, the famous people who speak things in the world are not great examples of godliness in speech. Conduct, that refers to your, your behavior, your natural behavior, the way you just respond and act. It's not, okay, I'm deciding to act a certain way. It's just how you generally act. That needs to be wonderfully godly. <laughs> it can't be despicable. Your habits can't be bad habits. Love, well, that addresses your relationships and, and your commitment to serve and, and put yourself second in helping and others, loving them, showing them kindness, doing them good. Faith, that probably refers to being faithful rather than the faith, because the focus is godliness here, not teaching. Be an example in faithfulness and, and, and being a person who is reliable, dependable, fulfills his or her commitments. Purity. Well, that covers all things with moral implications. A spiritual leader must be an example of morality. And remember, in our time, morality seems to be defined in terms of what's legal and illegal. That's not God's standard. God's standard is what is ethical or unethical as revealed by God. No sexual impurity, no financial greed, no fraud accusations, no kind of man-pleasing double standards for different people in the church. Purity, ethical behavior. You look at this list and you realize this is just everyday stuff. <laughs> he has to be an example of godliness in ordinary, everyday life. There's a reason some of the preachers in years gone by opened their, their kitchen for breakfast to whoever would come in. And they would have breakfast with everyone and then they would have family devotions together because they wanted their people to see their family life. I guess Facebook would be the equivalent now. <laughs> be godly even on Facebook. Let them see how godly you actually are is maybe a better way to put it. A spiritual leader must be a practical example of normal, everyday godliness. You see the strength of it in verse 15. Practice these things. Okay, train yourself for it. Get better at it. Immerse yourself in them. Okay, don't, don't get touched by other things. Be completely under this one, godliness. Make sure they can see you grow in godliness. Again, this is not just an isolated instruction. Chapter 4, turn over to chapter 6 of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. And so the, the love of money is mentioned above. Um, discontentment. Um, uh, and contentment, the positive of it, uh, controversies, gossip, slander, so as a speech, um, areas of example that he needs to work on. He says, you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, righteousness, that which is right, not wrong, godliness, that which reflects God's character, not man's. Faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you make the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You're teaching it well. Now, verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who, is his own test, who in his testimony only before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. Like, oh wait, this is courtroom scene again. Another charge. You must be guilty of this in the presence of God. Keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. I charge you, be godly until Christ returns. A spiritual leader who was a wonderful spiritual leader in so many ways and fell drastically in his old age didn't meet the expectation of God on his ministry. He's not a spiritual leader worth following anymore. You have to do it to the end. And that's why you as a church need to know these expectations of God on your spiritual leaders because we need the accountability from you too. At the end of the day, your spiritual leader is just another spiritual being, just like you are. You need to be faithful to the end. They need to be faithful to the end. 
It's so similar to that 2 Timothy 4. I charge you in the presence of God to be guilty of preaching the word. Now I charge you in the presence of God to be guilty of godliness. To the end. Titus 2, verse 7 and 8 says the same thing. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. Titus 2, verse 7 and 8. So that when a critic comes and accuses the church of something, that critic leaves ashamed. Not the minister or the church. There is a proper way for pastors to behave in the church of God. There's a proper way for elders to behave in the church of God. There's a proper way for anyone to stand up on any platform, of any technolo technological platform even, and say, I can exert a spiritual influence on your life. There's a proper way to do that. It's a wonderful way. Go do it that way. Influence people that way. But there's also an improper way. There's an improper way, and it's the more common way. Every spiritual leader should be expected to do it the proper way. Every spiritual leader should be expected from everyone, the world... Believers, unbelievers, it doesn't matter. Everybody should expect of them to teach truth and to model godliness. To explain the Scriptures and read the Scriptures and to command people to change as they themselves are commanded to change. Then, by God's grace, He will save Himself from disqualification till His dying day. And then, by God's grace, all Christians will be saved from falling away too. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, these are high expectations. They do not surprise us, for you are impeccably holy. There's no fault in you whatsoever. So, Lord, we do come first, perhaps, and confess that we do not believe the truth as we ought. We don't even know it as we ought. And Lord, as a result, we, our lives betray the fact that we don't live out the truth as we ought either. Please cleanse us from all unrighteousness, us as spiritual leaders of Living Our Bible Church and us as Christians who make up the church. Forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, restore to us the convictions from your word again. Teach us, exhort us through your word, through the teachers whom you have given us, through your Holy Spirit within us. And may we please you till you return and take us home, Lord Jesus. We look forward to that day, and we know it will be a day of reward if we stay faithful to the end. So help us for that. For your sake, amen.